idea here is to look at what's been done, uh, to look at that uh, sort of, uh, critically, with the idea that of how can we sort of amplify, you know, or how can we learn from what, what, what's, what's, what's been done. And, and, and I think from the organizers of uh, this session, there is an acknowledgement that there is some pioneering work, however limited that may be, and we just want to hear from that. And in the next session, we can talk about uh, how to either, uh, take that uh, forward. And we have uh, sort of uh, three uh, panelists, and each will speak about the uh, next 15 minutes to introduce that, and then it will be uh, open for, uh, for discussion. Leone, are you with uh, us? I'm, I'm with you and I'm good to go. Okay, all right, okay. So we'll start with the, uh, the panelists from afar, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll look at the, the panelists in the, in the room. Leone, over to you. Thank you. Um, so this is a little bit weird, uh, speaking to you remotely, so um, I'm just going to, my mammalian brain is just going to have to uh, adapt to the slightly different inputs, but thank you very much for letting me join you today. Um, I want to take a, a slightly higher level view um, and uh, think a little bit about how newsrooms are failing in this regard. And I mean, immediately one of my frustrations this morning is you know, after 15 years or nearly 20 years of doing this, I've been involved in so many conversations with newsrooms and training opportunities with newsrooms where we've tried to impress upon the higher level manage management within newsrooms of how urgent it is to integrate climate reporting into day-to-day -day -day news. And yet, invariably, the, the slots get deputized to the environmental and science writers who already know the gig, you know, they know the drill. So it's really frustrating that, you know, 20 years later we're facing this absolute crisis. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, and, yet, and yet, you know, we still are not able to get the editors into the room to have this conversation. So I want to talk a little bit about how newsrooms are failing, um, how this is an opportunity for us to self-correct. And, uh, I mean, the bottom line is that media is a key platform for shifting political and social dialogue in a country. We're a load-bearing wall within uh, any healthy democracy. That's what the fourth estate is. And if we aren't mainstreaming climate, then we're failing in our role. So I want to start by getting us to reflect on one of the cardinal principles of what journalism is, or, sorry, one of the cardinal principles that guides our day-to-day -day newsroom decision-making. And that's this notion of what's the harm. What is the harm of printing a story or an idea? Um, and I think we need to start thinking about what is the harm of downplaying the climate crisis, of sidelining the climate story, and of continuing a business as usual reporting. Um, I want to start with a, a, a analogy, and, and I, I realize that a lot of my colleagues are in the room, so this might not be new to you, if you could just bear with me. For those of you who haven't heard this analogy, um, hold on a sec. <coughs> Sorry, I have to cough. Um, and I mean, Vish uh, laid the, the, the sort of foundation really clearly of how serious climate is. But I, I want you to imagine that this glass is the atmosphere. And the space inside the glass is the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb all of our industrial era emissions. Now, the water in the glass is right up to here. And those are the emissions that have been put into the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But most of those emissions were put in there in the last 50 years. So that's been the time that you and I have been alive. And a lot of that time has been the time that you and I have been operating in newsrooms. That's the blink of an eye. The tiny bit of space that's left at the top, that's how much space is left to keep putting in emissions. Um, that's kind of our carbon budget. Once the glass tops over and the water starts to spill, that's when we slip over into irreversible climate change. Now, if I were to spill the glass, which I won't do now because I'll snap it on my computer, those are the extreme weather events that Vish was talking about earlier. That's, those are the extreme events that are showing us how unstable the climate is becoming. So that's bats falling out of trees during heat waves in Australia. That's uh, two record-breaking cyclones hitting Mozambique back-to-back -back within two weeks of each other. 
It's the drought that wiped out livestock and nearly brought Cape Town to its knees, water-wise. Those are the extreme weather events, <clears throat> but um, which you know gets kind of reported under the back of the newspaper because science and environment are still seen as a nice to have after newsrooms have allocated all of the resources to the more important beats like economics or politics, the hard news stuff, even sport gets way more time um, than these important kind of things. But two important and quite terrifying things have happened in the past two months. The first is we got um, <clears throat> news that our greenhouse gas emissions have topped up out at 415 parts per million, which is higher than our atmospheric greenhouse gases have been in three million years. So the last time uh, uh, um, the concentration was so dense um, the Arctic was ice-free, Antarctica had trees growing on it. That's an entirely different climatic state to the one in which modern civilization, uh, if that's the correct term, evolved. And the other thing, the other scary bit of news was, <clears throat> and sorry, this is going somewhere. The other scary bit of news is that the, the, the extent of Arctic um, thawing, um, uh, which is now 70 years ahead of schedule. This isn't uh, an extreme of weather event. This is one of the tipping points that Bush was talking about. Now, what I, from a newsroom perspective, um, my grave concern is that the e newsrooms are not challenging or reporting on the economic model that is driving the kind of extractive um, capitalism that is pushing us into literally climate collapse. Um, particularly our business editors need to be thinking about this, <clears throat> that <clears throat> we continue to report as though we can have infinite growth on an infinite planet. That is not the case. <coughs> so the size of this glass is fixed. And that's just physics. No amount of magical thinking or ignoring the problem is going to make this glass elastic. But our newsrooms and our business, ed our business press keep reporting as if this is um, a an elastic thing. You know, you can just keep putting more and more emissions in. We can't. You know, we can ignore gravity, but the apple is still going to hit us on our head. Uh, so, <clears throat> what is the harm then um, of continuing to report as though it's a business as usual, as though we can continue to have infinite growth from this capitalist system? Um, I did a piece recently for the Daily Maverick reflecting on um, how the newsrooms operated in the 1980s in, t in terms of what is the harm of how we report on apartheid. So um, newsrooms like the, uh, the kind of left-leaning Mail and Guardian, it was the Daily Mail back then, and the Fairview Blast, they took a very specific ideological position in the reporting. They, um, they understood that apartheid was uh, grossly unfair, undemocratic, and basically was committing crimes against humanity. And on the basis of that, um, took a very firm stance against the apartheid state. Now, because they understood that there was the system that needed, needed to be torn down. Now, imagine if the news editors had come to them in that context, uh, sorry, the, the, a business editor, editor had come to them and said, we want to run our business desk as the, when we, we maintain that apartheid is good for the South African economy, um, even though we understand that it's a, a grossly unfair system. Now, you can only argue that apartheid was good for the economy if you narrow your lens to say to show how it would have been good for the state, good for big business, and good for the white minority. You would have had to ignore all of the other economic fallouts of apartheid. You would have had to ignore the fact that the, your, the majority of your um, country was excluded from the mainstream economy, were locked into a system that gave them um, cripplingly low wages. And then you have to ignore the, the, the economic costs to individuals of being excluded from the education system, of not getting access to free health care, of not being able to buy decent nutrition so that children ended up with permanently stunted brains because they didn't get good nutrition in the first 1,000 days. You would have had to ignore the economic cost of people being um, trapped in informal settlements where they had poor policing and they didn't have fair access to the justice system. 
You can only argue that apartheid is good for the economy if you ignore all of those other um, economic costs and social costs. And that wouldn't only be uh, ethically problematic, but it would be um, intellectually dishonest, and it would be downright harmful for society, because you would be uh, maintaining a status quo that excluded the bulk of your population. Now, what I think we need to start doing in newsrooms is thinking about the climate crisis in exactly the same way. You can only justify business as usual reporting if you ignore all of these externalities of um, uh, the cost of climate change, and if you ignore the fact that our economic system is flawed. Um, and on a day-to-day -day, uh, decision-making process within our newsrooms, we just we can't justify uh, continuing like that. So, um, okay. Sorry, I can't read my handwriting. Uh, the fact that newsrooms. Um, the fact that newsrooms are not talking about the failure of the economic system, which Vish has outlined very clearly, and um, the fact that we are not mainstreaming the climate story, uh, means that we are complicit in this continuing inertia around society. Um, you know, climate change is not an environmental story and it's not a science story. It's politics. It's economics. It's corruption. This is the biggest corruption story of the century. Um, and in fact, it's even a sports story. If you look at the number of times the Argus Cycle Tour has been cancelled or shortened or the route changed in the past decade because of either um, high winds, uh, droughts, <coughs> so heat waves, flooding, fires, at least four or five times in the past decade. That has an implication for tourism and for the local economy. If that isn't a climate story, you know what is. Um, a couple of uh, closing points. Um, from the perspective of where the South African press has done a good job, South Africa, as, as Vish pointed out, is um, it's, we're the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases on the continent, um, and uh, we are a global leader in terms of how we should we should be a global leader in terms of how we, we respond. The biggest hurdle to South Africa not addressing the emissions problem is the pro-coal agenda within government. Yes. And um, this is, um, th there have been many commissions and there have been, uh, been court cases and there have been a lot of, there's been a really, lot of really good investigative journalism that has showed that the vested, the pro-coal vested interests in the ANC are driven largely by corruption, by patronage, and, and by, by various vested interests. And exposing that is one of the key um, ways in which we can uh, force the country towards a lower carbon um, trajectory, because that will get rid of the, the bureaucratic um, and legislative bottlenecks that are stopping renewables from coming on stream. It will get our country's um, uh, energy planning in line with what the modeling is saying, what, with how the markets are readjusting them, because uh, renewables are so much cheaper. So newsrooms that cover the corruption and the pro-coal agenda within government, that's key to driving um, a low-carbon transition. In terms of adaptation, I think one of the biggest problems is a lack of capacity within government at national, provincial, and local level. And <coughs> newsrooms are just not, are not joining the dots in terms of what uh, local level responses need to be to climate change. Um, city level responses, keeping um, uh, uh, aquifers um, part of the commons, keeping green belts um, in place, not, not just because they're pretty, um, but because they are airbags against the kind of local level climate shocks that we're going to experience. If newsrooms need to understand that every small little battle to keep a little green belt in place is actually about keeping a, a city more climate resilient. And journalists are not joining that, those dots yet. Um, one of the um, uh, two red herring debates that come through in the media all the time. The first one that uh, Vish has uh, already alluded to, and this is the question of population. Um, I, I did something for the uh, Daily Maverick recently on um, the, the question of whether we should have children or not, and, re and reflect some of the figures in there around how it's the, the rich families with the 2.4 kids that are driving the bulk of the uh, personal level emissions rather than the large family with eight. So, um, you know, that really is a bit of a red herring debate that uh, the media needs to self-correct on that. 
The second red herring debate is this thing of personal behavior. Um, yes, it's really important that middle class people could uh, reduce their consumption, reduce their flying time, reduce their meat, blah, blah, blah. But actually, we need to tackle the political economy that's driving climate collapse. And by that, we mean um, the corporate uh, interests, uh, which um, uh, Kevin didn't talk to and Fish has already spoken to, the corporate interests that allow, of which are, are more powerful than nation, the nation states that they're operating in. Um, these corporates are allowed um, have free access to the atmospheric space, which is a global common as well. Um, and that global common should be managed for the safety of everyone, not, and, and not just a, a corporate shouldn't be allowed to just capture that space for their own profits. These are the kinds of high-level questions we need to be having. Um, you know, what, what are we doing to tackle pro, the pro coal agenda within the ANC? What are we doing to hold corporates accountable for the environmental costs of having free access to the atmospheric space? What are we doing to reduce fossil fuel subsidies? These are the kinds of conversations we need to be having loudly and aggressively within the press. Um, so, so yeah, we need to we need to um, journalists need to join the dots in terms of um, global crisis versus local impact and local response. <coughs> we need to duplicate these red herring debates around the personal behaviour population problem. We need the mainstream media to actually start reporting across every single beat um, in a way that reflects the urgency. Um, no more business as usual reporting. And um, this idea of the corporate capture of the atmospheric space that is coming at the cost of literally life on Earth, why are we not having that? Um, what I find distressing is that we've been talking about this for 20 years and we're still here. And why has this room not got every single editor in Joburg sitting there? Yeah, exactly. That's okay. All right. Thanks, Lily. So, uh, I think like everybody here, I've, I've sort of thought about this uh, when I set up this presentation last night, uh, assuming that uh, I'd be speaking to a room full of editors who, who got the urgency. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what to say, uh, except to the four journalists who are here, Sipo, Mandy, Elise, and Leone who have heroically been going with this for years and decades and having to deal with this and are still here. And now I'm quite new to this um, and I'm starting to feel the tinges of a very specific kind of PTSD that comes from climate reporting. I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible that they're not in the room, but they're going to, you know, whether they like it or not. So I'll, I'll, I'll give the, the presentation anyway. And what I want to talk about is, is, is the fact that there is space for climate reporting to be nailing the big stories, to be nailing the front page news, to be nailing the investigative pieces. And uh, we launched our Burning Planet, and I'm going to start with it personally as well, because I, you know, I don't think anything is more personal than uh, you know, bio, bio side or echo side. Um, so, we launched our burning planet <coughs> in South Bronco uh, off of the back of the IPCC report and the IPCC report came out on the uh, 8th of October 
last year. And he said, what about talking my father died? And um, I, I did a deep dive into that report. I think it was a way of grieving, but I think more importantly what it was, was here was something external that was reflecting the end of my world internally. And so I completely assimilated this stuff uh, through the mourning process. And then I found myself on stage with Anton Harbour, Richard Poplack, and John Matteson talking about something completely inane, like writing novels in the age of Twitter. And I completely bombed this, this talk uh, and spoke about, has anybody seen the IPCC report? And um, this led to a conversation afterwards with Anton, and you all know who Anton is, and we spoke for a good 15, 20 minutes, why we're not looking at this. And, and we all know why. I mean, the editors just don't think it's going to leak. And the editors just have this preconception that you can't get rid of this. And uh, Public and I went back to his place and cracked open a bottle of whiskey, and we were like, well, let's give it a go. And it's actually all I wanted to write about because of where my head was. But I come from 15 to 20 years of reporting in another space, of, of reporting about civil conflict and crime and corruption. And it was very clear to me from this IPCC report that all the civil conflict, crime and corruption in the universe was right there in here, in here, as Leon has been saying. So we launched. Um, and we launched based on the science. Now, uh, Vish has gone very clearly into the science, but the, the, there's a point where the science meets the politics. So the, the, the top line scientific points for me were the fact that you've got from this IPCC report of global warming on 1.5 degrees, which quite frankly completely changed the media debate. And, and the Daily Maverick was, was aligned, um, not because we were speaking to them, but just because there was a global zeitgeist with the likes of New York Times and Guardian who were like, okay, this is real, this is, this is very real. Because you've got 91 climate scientists from 40 countries assessing 6,000 peer-reviewed papers over a three-year period. This is not a debate. This is not a debate. Um, and you've got this. At 1.5 degrees of global warming, you've got brutal damage to coral reefs, global crop failure, sea level rise is locked in for centuries, significant economic impacts. The IPCC told us that 1.5 degrees is within reach. We can, we can limit warming to 1.5 degrees. We're, we're at around 1.1 now. If carbon emissions, as we said, are slash 45% by 2030, that's 11 years away, and hit near, net zero by 2050. Here was uh, the line that I think has been quoted more than any other by the global media on this IPCC report, calling for rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. And it was this specific line that I believe, uh, in fact, that I've reported and that others have reported, and that is true, that, 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 that has fired a new level of global kickback from the fossil fuel industry. And, and there is a front line, and there is a war going on, and it is a war for the planet. I mean, these metaphors do stick to the page. They are true. They are real. At two degrees, uh, the fabric of modern civilization begins to unravel. Now, um, I was, and I'll talk, I'll talk a bit more about it, uh, thanks to Mandy, I was at the World Conference of Science Journalists in Lausanne uh, two weeks ago where some of the world's leading climate scientists and, uh, and, and uh, uh, science journalists came together and, um, you know, what, what was agreed in that room is that we're not going to make 1.5 degrees. There's no way to do I mean, Bob Watson, who's the former chair of the IPCC, and uh, as the chair of the IPBES uh, stated what uh, Dr. Lee, who's the current chair of the IPCC, wouldn't state at that meeting. The IPCC has to remain non-political. It's, it's the science. The other half of the UN is the politics, and that, that is captured. But the scientists are not captured. But Dr. Bob could say what Dr. Lee couldn't. And that is, we're going to hit 1.5 by early 2030. We're going to hit 2 degrees by 2060, and the locked-in carbon emissions at the moment are going to take us to 3.5 degrees by the end of the century. A lot of the planet becomes uninhabitable by the end of the century. For me, that it doesn't get more personal. I have a 6-year-old daughter and a 2-year-old son. It just doesn't get more personal. 
And if there are no editors in the room now, they're going to get here eventually, or you know, they're just not going to—they're not going to be relevant. I just can't see anything more relevant. Than it. Um, and so, the first interview we did, uh, and, and the first piece we did after the editorial, which was written by Public, uh, was was we did an interview with a local climate scientist who's one of the 91 international, a guy by the name of Francois Engelbrecht. And we led with the fact that we're warming at twice the global average. And we spoke about, you know, what's the science behind this? What are the implications for our farmlands and cities? Most importantly, will the country survive if trends remain where they are? And uh, we got Francois Engelbrecht to talk about this. And why, where we expected this opening piece to be completely lost, that was the opposite. We expected a Sisyphean task of having to push this thing up the hill and roll down again, just, just you know, carry on at it, and we were very prepared to do that, but I think we got 50,000 readers of it. And uh, that let us know that, you know, I mean, I think it's a myth that the reading public doesn't care about this. How can the reading public not? How can you not care about this threat to <coughs> your life? And, and I think Super proved that, uh, you know, incredibly well with, with, with the amazing piece of investigative work he did on on uh, the emissions, on, on you know, how polluted I, I hear it. Um, so, you know, for us, for Daily Maverick, and for specifically what we do, which is more of a, a, an investigative event, um, we're looking at where politics meets science. And um, Naomi Oreskes uh, spoke at uh, the World Conference of Science Journalists in Mossad, and, and she wrote the Earth text. On this, a book called Merchants of Doubt mm -hmm. uh, from 2009, uh, and you know she was she, she was introduced as somebody every journalist needs to read and go back to because this is how you do it, and she gave a fantastic presentation, uh, and I'll just you know go through a couple of the slides. You know I think a real important one is real science comes from scientists. Um, propaganda machines know this. So often they hire scientists. Mm -hmm. She talks about Project White Coat. Uh, you know, there is a conspiracy, and it's funded by the fossil fuel movement. We know this. We know ExxonMobil have, have 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 been funding the Heartland Institute and the Rand Corporation and these various right-wing think tanks to fudge the link between uh, fossil, the burning of fossil fuels, and global heating. And in fact, <coughs> and Naomi Oreskes was, was the person to create this link. The people they hired to do that were the very same people who had been hired by the tobacco industry to fudge the link between smoking and cancer. So these guys were experts at it. The difference was where the, the seven CEOs of Big Tobacco, the seven dwarfs of Big Tobacco, um, got completely nailed by US con Congress and by the US courts. And when you, the, the criminal courts, uh, the fossil fuel executives continue to get away with it. And they continue to get away with it because they have magnitudes of order, uh, they, they are orders of magnitude more powerful than big tobacco. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things that Naomi Oreskes says is, is inquire about funding. Nearly all climate change deniers are linked to a funding from fossil fuel companies. The information is really stated in press coverage where people are quoted. It is obviously relevant. There's a conflict of interest. And an example she gives is uh, a, a guy by the name of a professor by the name of Willie Soon, for years was widely quoted even by the New York Times as a skeptical expert. But it was revealed in 2015 that he had re received $1.2 million from ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel uh, affiliates. And then the New York Times stopped quoting him. Now these examples just go on and on and on. Let's look at you know how this plays out in South Africa. Here's where politics meets science in South Africa, in that map. We know this. We know this. Um, and here's why. Uh, this idea of a sunrise industry. This idea that this, it's, 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 it's a 23-year-old, 25-year-old, ANC development idea that the way we create this development and state and the way we grow the economy is we put all our money and our resources into the mining sector. What we know 
from investigating mining affected communities which is an incredibly important story in this country and a story that has had the, the oxygen sucked out of it by the focus on state capture, by the focus on the Guptas, is what's been happening in these mining affected communities and how what was laid out in legislation and what was laid out in the constitution, how the mineral wealth in the ground needs to belong to the citizens in this country, well it doesn't and it's an offshore bank account and we know how that works. We know how the traditional Khoisan leadership bill has been manipulated. We know how the traditional governance framework act has been manipulated. We know what's happening on the uh, platinum belt. And we're seeing it in the worst way in Kolobeni, where you have a community saying, we don't want your development. We don't want your development, mental state. Go away. We've been balanced like this for a long time. We know how this works. We don't even want pesticides in our land. Leave us alone. And where it comes back and back and back and back. And that's the call of any story. What you also got is this myth of clean coal. And this myth of clean coal came into this country from a former president of the World Bank, um, Jim Young Kim, who uh, two years after the World Bank had granted ESCOM a $3.75 billion loan, came to do a publicity tour of South Africa, and he knew that this was an incredibly controversial loan. And how did he know this? Because there were thousands of people demonstrating against it outside the UN headquarters and outside the World Bank headquarters. South Africa didn't want this. You were probably involved in those protests. And uh, so he comes with clean coal. Now clean coal and the idea of clean technology was developed by the fossil fuel, by Peabody Energy. It comes from them. You know, this is, this, this is spin of the highest order. And now it's being fed to us by the president of the World Bank. And seven years later, you've got it coming out of the mouth of not only Gwedi Mantashi, but Radebe and Tito Mbwene. And T Tito Mbwene was talking about it in the context of the 6.8 billion rand loan that the New Development Bank has just given to ESCOM to finish uh, the flue gas desulfurization units on Madupi, what they don't tell you is that that actually ups the carbon footprint of one of the largest and dirtiest coal-fired power stations on planet Earth. Am I running a bit out of time? All right. Um, Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, 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 okay. Yeah. How much more time? Okay, I can give you a minute. Well, five minutes. Yeah, five. Okay. Um, so, you know, our subsidies to the coal industry are the fourth largest in the G20. This was revealed a month ago, despite the fact that we're 70 million tons higher than the UK, which, as which Fish pointed out uh, a month ago, committed to the net zero target. But on a, here, here's what's quite scary to me, is that on a continental level, uh, uh, our president is about to become the AU head honcho in charge of climate change. He's about to head this from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. We should be leading, but we, lead, we are leading, we're leading the wrong way. We're leading the wrong way, the entire continent. Um, and then in global geopolitics, BRICS, I mean, it just goes on forever. I think the influence of Russia here, nuclear is back on the table. You know, Putin thinks climate change is a good thing for Russia because it opens, he does, and he states this on the record. It opens up the, uh, the Arctic for him. And, you know, he's not talking about the permafrost anymore. He's talking, he, he wants this to happen. So areas of investigation. Um, and, and, and these are stories that then, and these are stories that do well. And these are stories that actually tick the investigative boxes when it comes to what an editor wants and what readers want. Uh, so in terms of the IPBS global assessment, which talks about the fact that one million species are at risk of extinction and we have ecosystem collapse around the world. And so Bob Watson, who's the chair of this, um, you know, is talking about the twin threats. These things can't be divorced. Mandy and I were talking about this yesterday. Uh, these things can't be divorced. Climate collapse, ecosystem collapse, they're the same thing. And so, you know, here's one of the things that happened in South Africa, is, is that um, a Chinese company uh, that had put itself underneath the Belt and Road Initiative, which is the biggest development initiative on earth, $8 trillion by some estimates, right out of Beijing, right out of Xi Jinping, our BRICS friends, um, it did a secret deal with uh, uh, the Pondo King, King Indomasa Indomasa. And in the 
Kumasi and Damasi sold off 30 kilometers of prime Pondo land, wild coast land, directly inside the Pondo land center of endemism, which is a global biodiversity hotspot, which is where 50% of the world's biodiversity exists in like 2.4% of the land mass. Uh, the PCE is one of these. And so the Pondo King sold it off for a Disney playground and golf courses and casinos, but more importantly for uh, a marine fisheries harbor uh, to continue to rape the oceans and for a mine to, you know, perhaps there's titanium there, like there is a bit further up north. But, so King Indomase doesn't have to, or did, thought he didn't have to, um, tell, uh, gain, gain the consensus of his people because of the traditional Khoisan leadership. There, 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 there is a consequence, and these things are working together. Um, you know, the, the TKLB, is, is a Bantu state law that is coming back on, back on to, to, <coughs> to our system of legislation. And so we went at this, and uh, we went at this for six weeks, and we broke the story, and because of the story, the deal was off the table, because his subjects revolted. They're like, you can't do this. We don't agree. And that's what journalism does, and, and that's what it should do. Uh, another area of investigation is the IPCC. No, you know, you mentioned the climate change you, you, you mentioned this legislation, which is great on paper, but we have no emission reduction targets. Nobody's even talking about this. We go in the other way. When Ramaphosa talks about climate change in, uh, in the state of the nation address, I'm sorry, but it's bullshit. Yeah. It's just bullshit. And, and, and that's what we need to expose. And obviously, we have to expose the heavy, heavy emitters. What's going on in SASA? What's going on with ESA? Uh, and the consequences, I mean, you know, thanks to COPAC, you know, drawing the link between drought and domestic violence, drought and civil conflict, on and on and on it goes. This is going to start breaking down.
up and down. And then we started thinking about the environment, climate change impacts on that. And this idea of resilience. So this community, we used to farm all the time. They were self-sufficient. Now you're going to put them in these tiny little plots where there's very little space to garden. And there's also no employment. So that community is now stuffed, right? I mean, that's it. They're done. Um, for a 20-year mine, I think it was. And <coughs> that's when we started thinking, we need to have climate change. You both alluded to the fact that climate change is in every single thing. And we only said it should be in every single beat, right? So we started saying, well, every single story deals with climate change somehow. So whatever story we do, especially for environment, you put climate into it. So I just wrote about the communities living in the south of Durban, where they're down on the refineries and the port. And the asthma rates there, like there are kids in the school, there's the highest rate of asthma of any school in the world, and people are they're just destroyed. Like people's lungs are destroyed from living in this community. And it's been a case for 30, 40 years. And it's a huge part of um, social justice activism in South Africa. Also, those refineries are creating the oil and the fuel that we burn that warms the planet, right? So as MNG, what we've tried doing, instead of going so, like when the 1.5 report comes out and you get big things like that, we go big on that and we're saying, this is a huge issue, but we're trying to, or we've tried to, put environment, climate change in, all of those kind of stories. We'd like, because if you, if you keep saying climate change is a big issue, climate change is a big issue, and you don't say, here's a human face to it, and here are communities that have been destroyed, people fall asleep, right? I mean, is that, we are storytellers, we're telling a story, we want people to actually read the story, or listen to the story, or see the story. Uh, so that's the one thing in MG we've done, and the other one is, all is dedicated resources. I said we've had a report for 34 years, we've done reporting. So even when we had retrenchments in 2015 and we lost a whole bunch of reporters, the MEG said we will do environment because it is one of the biggest issues in this country, right? Um, and there was a point near Christmas where there were two reporters in our news room, so it's Philip DeBet and uh, me. So we had an environment reporter and then a general news reporter doing a, a Friday newspaper. Um, so we had a lot more environment stories <laughs> at that time. And, um, sorry, this is dying here. Um, so the story that we did two weeks ago, I think, because in the past we had editors who were afraid to lead up environment, right? This idea that environment shouldn't be, or people don't want to read it which is one of the big things, like it's boring and people yawn. Um, and there have been, if you look at, especially on the newspaper sales, environment, like water issues, or especially climate change, don't do that well, and people don't buy them. Um, we started having a discussion about that, and that is, as media, we're almost apologetic for talking about climate change. We're like, oh, we're sorry to bore you. This is a big issue, but, ha it's like giving people, I don't know, like broccoli or cauliflower, right? <laughs> We're trying to force into people's mouth. So one of the conversations we've been having is, you just leave on these issues. You're like, so two weeks ago we led on the fact that our air is so polluted. And um, the energy, the way our week works is we start on a Friday, we have a post-mortem meeting where we discuss the week that's just happened. Um, we talk about things we've missed and like what we can do better and ethical issues and what's happening in the media. And then we talk about the week coming forward. And um, when I first started talking about the story, people were like, oh, well, you know, that's, that's bad. The air is bad. Then by the next week on Wednesday, we have diary meetings and we talk about what's going to be the paper um, and also what our editorial should be like. What's the big issue that we're angry about? And, and this is talking about editors in the room. We're very, very lucky that our editor and deputy editor don't question climate change and they take this very, very seriously, right? So um, Khadija, my boss, we were talking about the story. She, her position to paraphrase on climate change is if we don't fix this, what's the point and all the other things that we report on, right? Um, and that's the leadership from the top. So we're very, very lucky to have that. And a lot of places are challenging that. So two weeks ago the discussion wasn't 
will this affect circulation? Will people buy this paper? I mean, we joked about it afterwards. It's probably going to be our worst selling edition ever. And then, you know, we'll hate ourselves. But um, the conversation at the time was air pollution, which is also a time change story because these are the factories putting this stuff that warms the atmosphere. It's a massive issue and it affects every single person. And if you frame it like that and you say, this is an environmental story, it's of national interest, it must lead. And you just, and that's part of the media leadership is doing it, broadcasting it, saying, we are telling you, the public, this is a big issue. So in our editorial, we talked about the importance of this and all the politics around why nothing's happening. Um, but that only comes from having good editors, but also having energy investing in me for eight years, nine years. Um, so I could write a story with the confidence of saying, this is a huge issue, this is an investigation, and it's writing in a style that's worthy enough to leave. Right? Um, and this is the problem with also not having full-time environment reporters of publications. If I'm relying on freelancers who pitch, and then the editors are not paying attention, or they don't have budgets. So as a concluding thing, the, so to get climate change in reporting is to have it in everything, like Leonie said, even in every single other beat, which now that I've become news editor at Mail and Guardian, that's also something we're doing. We're trying to say every single beat should look at climate change implications from health to business especially. And then the other thing is just resources. We talk about training and um, how the media should do things, but if you don't have reporters, you're not going to do things. Um, and a lot of publications just don't have reporters, they just aren't resources. So I think that's the big thing we need to solve. Because if you can get reporters in publications, they will do those stories, and they will eventually get the confidence to lead with those issues, and their editors will listen to them. That's it.